might be the most damaging um, aspects of her life. Shouldn't go around thinking I'm the Messiah or anything, but it's just, it just that, you know, she felt that she had a presence and she had a name and people would pay attention. We used to get lots of letters from just saying, you know, I saw your article, I saw you on the show, I saw you on that show, and, you know, it made, changed me and made me be able to confront my problems and, you know, obviously it had an impact. Margot had regained her self-pride as well as her family's approval. She went through hell. The fact that she, you know, quit drinking and taking drugs or whatever she was doing is extraordinary and really hard, and I really commend her for that because it's not an easy task. Once trim again, Margot was eager to resurrect her modeling career, but the fashion world was not so receptive. Margot used the press as a form of therapy. You know, she, she, again, she didn't have these boundaries. She didn't know where to stop. Uh, and she would bare her soul, which I think was very beautiful. An image maker doesn't want to know about a person's grief. They want to hear all the great things so that they can again sensationalize and, and, and create these omnipotent uh, images. Despite her sobriety and the weight loss, something was missing. In the 80s, she called me and asked me, could I do new pictures of her? She wanted to start her modeling career again. And when she came in and I tried to photograph her, I saw then that something was happening to her. And it made me very sad. She wasn't the same. In June of 88, Margot's mother died after a long bout with cancer. Margot had never been close to her mom. And friend Sandy Mirish remembered how she struggled with her feelings. Her mother wanted her to be there. And maybe that's what the separation and, and not communicating was for a while. But I know the last few, the, the last of, of Puck's life, Margot really had quality time with her. Back in New York, Margot finally gave up on the fashion world and tried to find work in other areas. She recorded an unreleased single and dabbled in art. From the artistic point of view, she used to do lots of collages, which were, you know, wonderful combinations of color and images. Also, she was dyslectic, so, you know, dyslectics have their own sort of twist. They don't see things in a logical way. And many great artists are dyslectic because they have this different way of viewing things. Then Margot tried the stage. She got uh, offered this play, The Women, which is a great play, at the Star Theater in Flint, Michigan, which is a very well-known regional theater. It was a terrific cast of, uh, of seasoned actresses, all women. You know, we worked on the lines a lot, and, and she got it. It was just confidence building. She realized she could do it, and she did. She did a very good job, got very good reviews, and liked it. But Margot still needed a more lucrative means to make those IRS payments. Margot's accomplishments with her bankruptcy were what kept her going. She loved being able to pay off the IRS. I mean, she had so much pride in that. Failing to find work in New York, Margot decided to move to L.A., rekindling old friendships. I know, I'm having a good time in L.A. Okay. But distancing herself from Stuart. I think we always loved each other, but she had things that she wanted to do, and after Betty Ford, grow and experience, and, and I did too, and so, like many people who were completely connected forever, it doesn't always work in a couple relationship. I liked Stuart. I liked your boyfriend, Stuart. I thought he was very nice. He was very proper, and he was... Uh, a good influence on her. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he came from a very fine family. But she always fell for some hippie type, you know, that was making candles up in the wine country. She was a dreamer, and dreamers always gravitate towards other dreamers. Once in L.A., Margot was really dreaming of landing herself some choice acting work. She and her new manager, David Mirish, decided to show Hollywood just how fit and photogenic she was by posing for Playboy. She was not in any way embarrassed the fact that she had posed nude for Playboy. She felt that this was an opportunity for her to let the world see that she was beautiful and overcome all those comments that Margot did not look good, Margot had been this, Margot had been that. She said, well, I want you involved and I want you to, to participate in, in, in helping me do this shoot. So I said, let's go to Belize in Central America. There it's beautiful water beaches, fabulous old boats, and a lot of jungle, and, and it's a heavy-duty rainforest adventure trip. 
And when the plane was landing in Belize, the whole plane is filled with Belizeans, and the cockpit opens, and the captain asks Margo to come in to watch this beautiful landing. And Margo's going, Yahoo, Yahoo, like this. And uh, the whole plane starts to, starts to applaud with her and goes, Hemingway, Hemingway, Hemingway. Playboy editor Marilyn Grabowski worked with her on the layout. I think at the time she did Playboy, she was very positive. It takes a great deal of positivity, believe me, to, to think of taking your clothes off or in front of strangers. And she was nervous and she was trepidatious, but she seemed in a very, very good place. Margot certainly garnered a lot of press from the layout, but no big parts. I think that Margot's a better celebrity than she was an actress. I think that knowing her and then seeing her in a movie are two different things. You, the, 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 the camera never captured the magic that you got in person. Finally, in 1991, unable to keep up with her bills, Margot filed for bankruptcy and started to seriously assess her future. I think Margot wanted to have a family. I think she wanted to get married again and settle down and be in love again like, like all of us do. Meanwhile, Margot's father, Jack, had remarried. Mario was starting a family of her own. And Muffet, now divorced, was battling mental illness. Margot felt she could get closer to her family by confronting some of the issues between them. One of her best lines was, um, you're sick as your secrets. That's one of those AA things. And I imagine there was a lot of secrets in that family. I'm not real sure, but she was always trying to find the truth. The reality of Margot's past became clear to her, and she felt honesty would set things right. Denouncing her grandfather's legacy, she spoke out for animal rights. That's why I actively support the Humane Society in the United States in its efforts to give animals their rightful place in the world. After all, it's their world, too. She publicly disclosed that she was an epileptic and worked with director Jackie Vela to educate others about the disease. She spoke openly about her epilepsy, which is pretty unusual for the entertainment community. Um, it's been several decades since anyone has, um, and, and especially in recent years since my time, that I can remember any entertainer that has openly said, I have epilepsy. And then, in a stunning revelation, she confessed she had been sexually abused as a child by her godfather. But for the Hemingways, people of action, not introspection, this was one confession too many. The man was dead who, you know, she was in, who supposedly did these things to her and, you know, her family did not um, embrace her at all. Instead of moving closer to her family, Margot moved further apart. She wasn't doing it to hurt her family. She just needed to get it out for herself so she could go on with her life. When we come back... They must have given her something, some kind of a, an elixir of the gods or something. But she flipped out completely. In late 1993, Margot made a series of public confessions concerning her troubled past, revealing that she had allegedly been sexually abused by her godfather. She astonished and alienated her family. Unable to turn to them, she tried to turn to God. Margot's spiritual quest took her around the world many times, often with friends like Linda Livingston. She would go to Hawaii and meet all the spiritual people in Hawaii that she could meet. She would go to Europe. She searched, went to India to search out Sai Baba. I mean, she was really trying to find her, her spiritual side. And that's one thing we did love about her. Margot would leave all of us at our activities and go out on the beach. And she would sit there for hours, whistling to the seagulls, sort of communicating with them. She always used to go away on these treks, and she would go to, there was a place, I think, that you go to up in Wyoming, some place that's where you go to, there are Indians, and they put you down in a pit, and you sit there for four days, and you get in touch with yourself. I loved all the little kooky things she did. It was always something. Next time you met her, she was doing something that was like so way out. 
like, you know, you would be like meditating over your food. She would be like, oh, no, 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 I sprinkled this over my food. While Margot's journeys revived her spiritually, they did little to relieve her financial woes. Margot needed money to exist. She was never kept by a gentleman. She did not live with male roommates. She always supported herself. So we had to keep looking for ways to make money. By now, Margot's hopes of landing Hollywood work had waned. So she agreed to make a movie with Argentine filmmaker Eduardo Montes. She was very much into the, the spiritual energy, but, but I don't know how much of it was Hollywood, how much of it was uh, herself, the heavy weight of the, uh, of the name she carried, and how much all of that was a refuge. Margot had conceded that as far as acting, she had only her name to offer. We bought a last name that would sell. I think it's terrible. She abandoned all hope of finding meaningful work in L.A. and retreated again to her beloved Idaho to write her memoirs. She could be outgoing and wonderful, but if she was hurting, she wasn't around. She was hurting alone somewhere, and I think she hurt a lot at the end. Occasionally, Margot left her snug hideaway to substitute for her father on a local nature show. Hi, I'm Margot Hemingway. Welcome to Incredible Idaho. My father, Jack, who's using the age-old excuse to play hooky, has gone fishing. In November 1994, Margot embarked on her most ambitious spiritual quest. She told me that she wanted to go to India and that she really wanted to go on this search her soul. And I think that was the beginning of the end. Margot traveled to an isolated ashram in India to meet spiritual leader Sai Baba. Friends and family lost contact with her. Then, in December of 94, she mysteriously resurfaced in her birth city of Portland, Oregon. Her head had been shaven, and she claimed to hear voices. I remember getting a call from Margot. She said, well, I just got back from India, and I cleared off 10,000 life, and, and I ended up in jail. They must have given her something, some kind of a an elixir of the gods or something, but she flipped out completely. Margot's family retrieved her from Portland and committed her to a mental home in Blackfoot, Idaho. After observing her for several weeks, her doctors decided to strengthen her epilepsy medication. The side effects were debilitating, and Margot would often experiment with the dosages. There are side effects to all medications, and of course there are side effects to anti-epilepsy medications. Some of the different side effects uh, can be depression, uh, uh, irritability. Upon release from the clinic, Margot stunned her friends by heading back to L.A. I just assumed that she would be more comfortable or happier in Idaho, but who knows what demons followed her around every day. Uh, who knows if she shook them when she was in the backwoods or not. Margot actually found tranquility in the Los Angeles landscape. She took rigorous hikes in the mountains and long, soul-searching walks by the beach, often stealing friends from their work to join her. Margot and I did a lot of things together. We'd go hiking a lot. Hiking with Margot was always an interesting adventure because nobody could keep up with Margot. And the city also offered many alternative ministries for Margot to explore with like-minded friends like Reverend Bill Minson. She was looking really at having uh, a life without a lot of the confusion um, that these issues that she was that she was going through but most looking to be a larger part of what God's plan was I, I pray every day I say thank you to God in the universe but of course there was the never-ending quest to make a living in mid 1995 Margot took a part in the low-budget film, Dangerous Cargo, with Rosemary Belden. But she had trouble during shooting. She couldn't sleep at night. So she would uh, ask between takes even, Eric, could I lay down, you know? And um, he'd let her, and it would cause us delays, of course. I must say she was very cheerful. Like, the minute she got up again, she'd, uh, she'd be there, and she'd always have her lines. Can I take it, huh? Russian for please. 
But I think we had the most fun together, let's say, in, in the shootout, just because, you know, we're both not the youngest, and yet here we got to run around and do things and uh, act like stuntmen, you know? Despite her own health problems, Margot was still zealous about healing others. She appeared in a substance abuse infomercial with Dr. Brian Allman. I'm someone with incredible willpower. And let me tell you, that part of me, the part of me that kept giving in to the addiction would win over and over again. She said that I really want to do this because I suffered for so long and I went to so many programs and I tried so many things that I wasted a lot of years. Margot was also enthusiastic about a pending sportswear and fragrance venture with her new agent, Graham Kay. She wasn't really interested in doing films. I, you know, I, I, the money was great. And, um, you know, Margot would be the first one to admit to you that uh, she said, look, Graham, she said, um, you know, I'm never going to do ordinary people. You know, she said, I may not even do Savannah. She didn't take herself too seriously. But when Margot was modeling, she was a real pro. But then Margot did land an extraordinary role. I'm Margot Hemingway, and this is Wild Guide. I'm the wild guide, of course. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. <laughs> and it's about endangered species. So far, we've shot um, about the manatees and crocodiles and um, certain snakes. Wild Guide producer Ray Donahue was thrilled with his new show host. She just said, you know, this is the kind of thing that I live for. This is what I've been looking for. This is the type of show that is what I really want to do. So um, I felt right, instantly I felt she was right for it because I knew she had the excitement for it and that's the most important thing. But again, enthusiasm could not compensate for Margot's medical problems. It was a great segment that we did in Florida with her and the manatees, but she got really sick and she got the shivers and I think she actually um, had a, um, a little mild um, seizure, an epileptic seizure. We still went to the locations, but we didn't take Margot. She was under a lot of medication. She had a lot of medication she was taking. Um, and the medication, apparently, that she was taking wasn't mixing well with other medication. You know, it made her feel, like she said, less than human. She knew that she would be in conversations and all of a sudden she would veer off and she would lose track of what was going on. And that was a result of the medication. In mid-1996, in perhaps an effort to rekindle their relationship, Margot journeyed to Venezuela for a visit with her ex-husband, Bernard Fouché. I'm going down there for um, to do a, a commercial on the, uh, on the on the island of Margarita, which will be fun, with an old beau of mine, which was my ex-husband. But too much time had come between them, and a reunion was not to be, according to Bernard's daughter Talia. You know, it's like you don't have a relationship after you split. When you love somebody for so many years, so dearly, so passionate, like they they loved each other. You'll never forget about that. Margot returned to L.A. and in June decided to bolster her spirits with a change of scenery. She found a studio apartment just steps from the sand of Santa Monica Beach. She hadn't been happy in uh, the apartment that she lived at. But the other thing was she always wanted to be near the ocean. But even in this quaint community, Margot could not find peace. The tenants below her kept late hours and there was friction between Margot and her landlady. No sooner had Margot moved in, she was asked to leave. On Thursday, June 27, 1996, perhaps feeling rootless and a bit lonely, Margot comforted herself by joining friends at a Hollywood night spot. She came to hear Millie sing at Cicada, and uh, she came into the back room where Millie was singing, and Millie handed her the mic, and she sang, and she looked beautiful. She was incredible. Uh, she spent the night with me that night because the night before, somebody was doing a movie in her house. That night, Margot had her most restful sleep in days. She awoke at 7 a.m. and left for a hike in the mountains. When we return... Sometimes when you don't hear from Margot, you know, you figure she's off, you know, gallivanting with one of her spiritual friends, you know, and she'll be back. Throughout 1995 and 96, Margot Hemingway experienced a lot of personal highs and lows. She was genuinely excited about new projects, but continually plagued by medical problems and loneliness.
I called Margo Saturday twice and left two messages because she was upset about the apartment, that she had to find a new apartment. And then, was it you who told me that she put a deposit down on another apartment, that she mm -hmm. found another apartment? So mm -hmm. I thought, okay, so everything's fine. And then Monday morning, I called Judy, and I said something, I, I just woke up with a vibe, and I said, something weird has happened. And so Judy said, well, let's go over, and she went over first, thank God. On Monday, July 1st, Judy Stabile, an artist and friend, drove over to Margot's apartment. When no one answered, she called a worker to break in and her friend Gigi for support. At the age of 41, Margot Hemingway was dead. The cause was uncertain, but police said there were no signs of foul play and no evidence of suicide. Toxicology tests were ordered. The entire world was shocked and saddened and a media blitz ensued. Margo was found just one day shy of the 35th anniversary of her grandfather's suicide. The tabloids were ablaze in speculation. When a Hemingway dies early, the media wants to think it's suicide. And they don't want to think that she died of natural causes or it was an accidental death. They want it to be a suicide. Margo was cremated and her ashes were buried in the shadow of her famous forebearer during a private memorial service in Ketchum. Marielle was, was Marielle wonderful. Marielle was beautiful. Yeah, she was really wonderful. You can see the love she had for her sister. And Jack was, Jack. well, he, he, he did the best he could. He was he acted like a gentleman, but I know he was, it, it hurt him a lot to lose her. The thing that I find is strange is I, I guess she was cremated and then, uh, Buried. then she was entombed. And I can't, I mean, if, us, that just if you're cremated, your ashes could be spread. And then, she but, was a free spirit. Her ashes should be spread all over this valley. A second service for her friends was held at the Agape Church in L.A. And the memorial fund was set up with the Epilepsy Society. Then, seven weeks later, on August 21st, the findings were released. The coroner ascribed Margot's death to acute phenobarbital intoxication based on high concentrations in her vital organs and ruled it a suicide. Spokesman Scott Carrier explained their decision. Because of the decomposition factors, we were unable to uh, obtain a sample of blood. So we had to do extraction from liver, brain, and kidney. We weren't able to tell you how many tablets were, no, we can't do that. If we had a blood sample, chances are we would be able to give you an estimate number. Margot was the fifth person in four generations of Hemingways to die by their own hand. Well, I think the doctor reflected, if I'm not a mistaken in the opinion that there was some family history uh, of her having this uh, but I think the overwhelming factor is the presence of the uh, large quantity of phenobarbital. Margot's friends however questioned how much family history weighed in the coroner's decision and voiced their doubts to this day. I just find it hard to believe that she could have done that intentionally without without leaving a note of some kind or having some kind of a a more spiritual setting. Margo just wasn't good with taking medicines correctly. She just, she, she was the kind of person where if she was feeling great, she didn't take it at all, even if she was supposed to. And if she was feeling terrible, she would either take too much or switch him around. I know this sounds insane, but I mean, did she like take like three doses that day or you know what I mean? Or was she weak? Was, was she, had she dieted so much that it just, Got her. I mean, I just still, I mean, why didn't she leave a note? Margo was not the kind of person that would intentionally do something. She would do it by accident. And I don't agree with the coroner of Los Angeles, whatever he says. Others, however, had different emotions. To me, it's a little bit more than that. You don't let someone, and I get very angry about this, you don't let someone who is, by this point, have, having serious mental uh, disorders that are not being, this is apart from the epilepsy, that are not being medically a, a addressed alone. I don't want to be dramatic about it, but I, I, I really do believe that she died of a broken heart. Broken heart, suicide, uh, overdose, uh, an accident. What killed Margo? We all did. Regardless of how she died, the world had lost a magnificent woman. Ultimately, 
the most important thing to remember is what she gave to everybody that uh, experienced her in this life, not how she left it. Her stature was such that she could walk into any room and command attention. But her humility was such that she could walk into any room and hold anyone's hand. I'm so happy to have known her all those years because she really helped me in my life of growing too. And I just wish I had never, not taken her for granted, but I never thought, I never thought I'd be living without her. You know, so cherish your friends. That Friday she died and we were doing our usual talking in the hot tub and I, all of a sudden I went, oh my God, David. I said, oh, you doing what? I said, the biggest shooting star I ever saw going straight down. And that's typical Margot. She would want to say goodbye. I believe in rolling with the punches. You have to keep fighting. That's what life is all about. Rolling with the punches and leading with your heart.